How are we doing now? Oh, okay. Shall I begin again? So this is actually my first time at the uh, Triad stage. And I'm so pleased that my first time can, can be a performance on stage. I made it mock by the world. Uh, I don't think we can capture the whole of a 15 year uh, career, not to mention uh, an entire man's life in 15 minutes or so. So uh, I've been asked to kind of give some sketches of uh, Hitchcock uh, in the early stages of his career, uh, of which the 39 Steps was uh, one. Uh, and I'll, I'll begin with uh, an anecdote and continue through several more anecdotes until we get to the end. Uh, one of Hitchcock's favorite stories for interviewers uh, was of how his father to teach him a lesson since when Alfred to the police station note saying he had been The uh, policeman then locked him in a cell saying this is what we do to not girls. Hitchcock claimed always to remember uh, the clang of the door which was the hope and the sound and solidity of that closing cell door of the bolt. He was released minutes later uh, and some tell him it's five and others are much more. The story may be apocryphal. Hitchcock's many three talents did gather some embellishment of but it's theme, that of the wrong man, persecuted and imprisoned, become a constant reiteration in his work. Now, he was born in 1899 to a family of three grocers, strapped with a little room behind the shop. Young Alfred was a retiring sort in school. He was pudgy and unathletic, uh, and admonished by some uncharitable classmates for smelling fish, <laughs> something unavoidable given his family. On the other hand, uh, as his authorized biographer, uh, John Russell Taylor, tells it, uh, Hitchcock enjoyed making deliveries by horse-drawn cart, uh, husking walnuts, and learning the trade. Patrick McGillian, in an apt but perhaps over-the-top sentence, suggests a boyhood not all darkness, nor all sunshine, but like a Hitchcock film, a constant interplay of shadow and light. Uh, Hitchcock's adolescence coincided with World War I, uh, and in, in interviews and detailed scenes uh, with this characteristic mixture of uh, horror and humor. Enemy bombs are being dropped on London. The family is at home on the floors. Bombs explode outside. His mother is under a table, eyes shut, murmuring her prayers. Despite the danger, the family still serves to his mother stops praying just long enough to say, one child for me. <laughs> Another story, Zeppelin Ray bursting shrapnel outside of the windows, his mother again saying prayers as poor mother tells his stories. An attempt to get into her wounders by shoving both of her legs into the same opening. <laughs> After grammar school, Hitchcock began working at Henley's, a local manufacturing company in sales. He took art courses at Goldsmiths College on the side. And he began going to the theater and saw the lodge in 1960, which became the source of his first Hitchcock film in 1927. Uh, he frequented art museums and particularly appreciated French models. He began writing for the Henry Telegraph, his first public publication there. Uh, he was only about 20 years old. I actually brought that with me afterwards in the QA. Uh, if you'd like, I can read it for it's very short, but it's very indicative of his style. Uh, and he became fanatically obsessed with films, particularly American films, which he thought were far superior to British, uh, both technically and thematically. He left Henley's to work as a title writer for famous players, uh, Lasky British Producers London, which was a production branch of Paramount. So even though he was working at British studios, he actually got an American uh, training program. Uh, he eventually worked his way through the second unit and uh, through assistant director to you uh, with 1925's Pleasure Garden, which I believe is the to play today, before he moved on to Galmont Studios, who would produce 30 steps in 1935. Uh, from the start, he gravitated towards thrillers with mean streets of humor. He was fascinated by real life murders and murderers, perhaps owing to some degree uh, to the uh, not 
divided this home in your white chapel. <coughs> Later, he liked to say, the enjoyment of fear involves watching ordinary people in bizarre situations. And certainly, the 39 steps qualifies for this designation. Uh, Hitchcock's films, uh, as his production designer, Robert Boyle, explained, were his fairy tales played against a realistic environment. Though the plots and machinations may be unrealistic, the settings and scenarios were completely plausible. The tension between the two created both Hitchcock's suspense and his humor. Another of his childhood interests that continually reappears in his films is the love of imaginary voyages, uh, which as a child gave a plot a world map hung in his bedroom with a copy of Cook's Continental Tours guide. Hitchcock's men often travel vast differences and quickly, creating narrative ellipses that gloss over some of the unreality. <coughs> in the 39 steps, Film, for example, the fourth bridge introduces us, introduces us to Scotland and allows Hannay to make uh, a daring escape from the train. And the next we know, uh, we're in the Highlands. Hannay having apparently hiked 100 miles under the cover of a single fade out. I was actually uh, quite curious as to how the, uh, the stage adaptation came with vast geography. That's pretty much how it works in the film. <laughs> Uh, did he, uh, as David Cairns playfully suggests, just fold his map and leap across the crease? Uh, or there's the scene where Hannah discovers he's walked into the clutches of Professor Jordan and the set of fingers. Hannah makes a run for it, Jordan shoots, and we fade into a police station, with Hannah telling the story to the chief. Again, very similar to uh, how the play uh, works. How did he escape and get away? Well, the bullet hits a hymn book, left in the pocket of uh, his overcoat. Film for the Thames that held me. <laughs> and he, he manages to get out of the house and steal a car. You know, we suppose Jordan left the room without making sure Annie was dead and disposing of the body. But it really doesn't matter, does it? Part of the delightful paradox of Hitchcock is his meticulous plan. Before shooting a single take, uh, he had planned every single shot and edit of his film. <laughs> uh, for improbable plots. And this recurring trope was one of ultimate heart, uh, being wrongfully accused, being mistaken for someone else. The 39 Steps was uh, crucial to understanding Hitchcock's entire career. Uh, following his biggest hit and first real spy set of tour film, The Man Who Knew Too Much, uh, Hitchcock found that the genre fit him like a second skin. The 39 Steps uh, is the second in a series of six such films uh, between 1934 and 1939, including The Man Who Too Much, Secret Agent, <coughs> Sabotage, The Lady Vanishes, and Jamaican Man. That series was broken up by 1937's just regular raw man film, Young and Innocent. Uh, and following 1939's Jamaican Man, Hitchcock uh, moved to Hollywood. So this was nearing the end of this British period. And at the time of production on the 39 Steps, he was already entertaining offers uh, to move uh, across the Atlantic. So the 39 Steps represents uh, Hitchcock's maturation as a filmmaker uh, and the articulation of themes that define our apotheosis in the great American films. It's a template for North by Northwest, with uh, the actor Robert Dumont, who played uh, uh, Hannah in the film, as the quintessential Hitchcock male. He's smooth talking, capable but not overly physical, quick on his feet but foul. And always, above all, always in the wrong place at the wrong time. <clears throat> it's also the debut of the icy blonde archetype, uh, later typified by Grace Kelly, Ingrid Bergman, <coughs> Tippi Hedren, Kim Novak, and others. Uh, Pamela in the film, played by Madeline Carroll, uh, who also starred in on subsequent film, uh, Secret Agent, uh, sets the, the, the mold for uh, the strong, strong will, capable woman who is potentially uh, the male character's ruin or rescue or both. And it's the definitive debut, debut of the MacGuffin. And the MacGuffin, if you've never heard of that before, it may be a Scottish name taken from uh, a story about two men in a train. 
And this is the story as Hitchcock told it to Francois Truffaut. One man says, what's that package up there in the baggage room? And the other answers, oh, that's a MacGuffin. The first one asks, what's a MacGuffin? Well, the other man says, it's an apparatus for tra trapping lions in the Scottish Highlands. And this is a very uh, popular story. Uh, and like many Hitchcock <clears throat> stories, it's meticulously planned but improv. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, uh, behind the wrong man, Hitchcock's primary theme is about being someone who you are not. The performance of identity, the public self, and what darkness lies beneath. Think especially of Psycho, Shadow of Doubt, Strangers on a Train, <coughs> Rope, and Vertigo. And all of that was tightly interwoven with a Freudian obsession with sex, sometimes incestuous. He was a man obsessed with voyeurism and with sexual powerlessness. He often liked to introduce himself as Hitch and wait a beat before scandalizing his audience at him without the cock. <laughs> Guilt. On to guilt. <laughs> guilt, hidden, on a, a, hidden under a guise of normalcy, was another theme, perhaps in part owing to his Catholic upbringing. Religious imagery abounds, also often connected to sex. There's a fine shot uh, in the film version of 39 Steps of a priest who's sitting across from the lady's underwear salesman as he displays his wares. Confession often leads to relief, but of an ambiguous sort. Hannah confesses to the Calvinist Proctor's wife as, she, as he hides from police. She helps him escape and gives him the heavy overcoat that contains the hymn book. But in the film version, in return for her kindness, her husband, uh, who had been trying to sell Hannah out for a reward, beats her. And the camera cuts away, uh, cutting her story off uh, from the rest. It's a very powerful scene. Mr. Memory confesses uh, what the 39 steps is and shares amazingly, I cannot believe he remembered all of that, uh, a meaningless mathematical formula from the guffin that begins the whole paper. And for his trouble, he's shot and killed. His dying words expressing relief that he no longer has the formula on his mind. The churches and I confess with Montgomery Cliff the rosary beads that Henry Fonda clutches in The Wrong Man, the cathedral in Vertigo, guilt and confession everywhere, and suspicion of what lies beneath. Most often, it's Hitchcock's women, his icy blondes, but also occasionally his brunettes, who are suspicious of strange, frightening, and alluring men in their lives. Think of the 39 steps, and then an increasing levels of sophistication from Joan Fontaine and Laurence Olivier and Rebecca. Fontaine again and Cary Grant in Suspicion. Ingrid Birch and uh, Gregory Peck in Spellbound. And sometimes these are good fellows, but not always. Think of the doom to Janet Lee and Anthony Perkins in Psycho. Or most insidious and disturbing of all, and Alfred Hitchcock's own favorite of his films, uh, Teresa Wright and Joseph Cotton in Shadow of Death, which we haven't seen after We do not know who we are, and we are never who we say we are. And ultimately, that is Hitchcock's cinema, a cinema of fear, in which circumstances force ordinary men and women to be who they are not, to suspect hidden identities in others, to hide shadows in light. Something I think of particular significance in the stage adaptation of on sets that we watch today is the very source of much of its humor. We have four actors, amazingly, playing close to 150 characters. <laughs> After a while, I have to imagine I'd be thinking, wait, who am I here? <laughs> so those are my prepared remarks. I have other remarks prepared in case you have questions uh, or perhaps we can simply discuss. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. For having me. Thank you.